Hello everyone, so suppose that you hold a chain of length L and mass capital M at a height of H above a set of scales, and you hold the chain at its very top end so that the whole chain is under tension and just hangs vertically under gravity. Then, at some particular moment, you just let go of the chain, you release it from rest, we define this moment to be time t equals zero, and the chain is going to fall onto the scales, and so the scales are going to give us a reading of mass that's going to be changing over time. I'm calling that lowercase m as a function of time. Now the complication here is that that reading, m of t, is not purely due to the mass of the chain which is already resting on the scales. There's going to be an extra contribution coming from the fact that as each link of the chain hits the scales, it exerts a little impulse, thereby making the effective mass look bigger than it actually is. So what we're going to do in this video is find that effective mass reading as a function of time for all times um, bigger than zero, the instant when the chain is dropped, and we're going to finish by sketching a little graph of m as a function of t, just to visualize how our reading is going to change over time. Now one technique that's often helpful with problems like this when you have something like a chain, which is not a rigid body because it doesn't keep a fixed shape, is to split your object into infinitely many infinitesimally small elements because then you can just treat each small element as a particle, and we know how particles behave. So to help with that I've just defined a couple more symbols on my diagram. We've got x and dx, so x is just a vertical coordinate measured from the surface of the scales that just tells you how far above the scales any particular element of the chain actually is, and then dx is just a small increment in x. It tells us how long the element of the chain that we're going to consider um, at a particular moment uh, is. Now I just want to point out that we are making a bit of an approximation here, which is that in reality a chain is really a collection of finitely many rigid bodies, right? You can treat each link of the chain, which of course has a finite size, as a rigid body, but we're pretending that there are infinitely many uh, very, very small elements, right, these dx's. We'll still be able to get a very good theoretical approximation of m as a function of time, but if you were to do this experiment in real life and actually measure m of t, you would find that the curve that you get is not quite as smooth as our model would suggest, because the chain is really made up of discrete elements. So as I've written down here, uh, we're going to say that at some arbitrary time t, the element which is just coming into contact with the scales is the element at position x, and uh, which has a length of dx. And so two things that would be useful to know are firstly, x as a function of time, in other words, which bit of the chain is hitting the scales at any given instant, and also we want to know how fast that element of the chain is going, because the speed of the element is going to uh, determine how much impulse it exerts on the scales when it comes into contact with them. Now fortunately the equations of motion that govern uh, this chain are actually quite simple for two reasons really. Firstly because the chain starts fully extended and under tension and therefore as it moves down it is actually going to behave pretty much like a rigid body until the bottom links start to hit the scales. In other words it keeps that fully extended um, shape. And secondly the only external force acting on the chain is its own weight. There are internal forces, right? there's a tension in the chain which varies um, along the chain, but those are internal forces and they don't affect how the chain moves as a whole. Now the conclusion of all that is that just like any other object undergoing freefall, the chain accelerates with an uh, acceleration of g downwards and therefore each individual element is also just undergoing acceleration um, of magnitude g. And that means that the motion of each element of the chain is described by the SUVAT equations or the constant acceleration equations. So I've just written out my five kinematic variables S, U, V, A, and T. Let's think about what they are as applied to this particular problem. Your S is your displacement. If we take it downwards as being the positive direction because everything is moving downwards, then the displacement of a given element by definition will be that coordinate X. The initial velocity u will be zero because we release the chain from rest. The final velocity we don't know yet, but we are interested in it, so let's just keep that as um, v and we'll figure that out later. Acceleration, as we said, is g. Again, I'm keeping it positive because we're taking downwards as positive. And the t is just the time. I've already called the time t um, in the argument of our effective mass function. So let's just keep that as t as well. Now, we wanted to find x as a function of time, remember, you can do that quite straightforwardly using the kinematic equation s equals ut plus a half at squared, because the ut term just disappears because u is zero. Um, so this would imply that x is just a half gt squared, right? So this is telling us which element of the chain is hitting the scales at any given time t. Uh, we also care about how fast that element is going, remember, so we want v. You can do that 
um, using the Suvat equations, a different Suvat equation, or you can just differentiate x with respect to time now that we've got x. And if you do that, and straightforwardly, you see that v is gt. So in order to get our effective mass as a function of time, what we really need to know is how much force each little bit of the chain is exerting on the scales as a result of its impact. And to do that, we can use um, Newton's second law in its full form, which is that force is rate of change of momentum. So F is dp by dt. Now, one way to interpret what this uh, dp by dt means is that each little element of the chain comes in hits the scales with an initial momentum of dp and that momentum is reduced down to zero in a time of dt so if you interpret it that way then you can write your dp your little um, momentum element as mass times velocity the velocity is just this v that we got up here so let's just write that as v let's call the mass element dm we're considering an infinitesimal part of the chain and so we should write the mass as inf infinitesimal as well so it's v dm by dt. So what are we going to do about this dm? Well, uh, assuming that the chain has uniform density, which most chains do because they're just made out of equivalent links uh, made out of the same material, the mass is just going to be proportional to the length. So your total mass of your chain is capital M. The mass per unit length is going to be M divided by L. And then you're just going to scale that up by your length element dx to find the mass element. So we put all that together. Um, it's v times m dx over l over dt, which rearranges nicely to just m v divided by l times dx by dt. But of course, by definition, the rate of change of distance x uh, is just velocity. And so dx by dt is v, and you get m v squared divided by l. But we already know v is a function of time. It's just gt. So if you want this force as a function of time, we just write it as m g squared t squared divided by l. So we'll come back to that force F and use that a little bit later. But of course, the other thing we have to know in order to get our effective mass as a function of time is how much of the chain is already resting on the scales, because the part of the chain on the scales is, of course, going to be exerting its own weight on the scales. So if we just add something to the diagram, I'm just going to put a little arrow here, because this red bit is the bit of the chain that will already be resting on the scales by the time the element at a position X um, has just come into contact with the scales. And you can see from the diagram that this is just given by x minus h. And therefore, well, I guess I should turn this into an equals. The mass already on the scales is, well, it's the mass per unit length, m divided by l, multiplied by that length that we just marked on the diagram, x minus h. And we can even substitute um, x as a function of time. We know it's a half gt squared, because ultimately we need everything as a function of time, right? So this is just m per unit length uh, times half gt squared minus h. So we can now actually combine those two contributions, the force due to the falling chain and the mass already on the scales, to figure out the effective mass reading that the scales will actually give us. So lowercase m, the thing that we want, um, is going to be, I'll start by just writing down the expression for the mass already on the scales, because that's easy. So m over l times um, half gt squared minus h. Now notice that we can't just add on this um, mg squared t squared over l because that's a force and what we want is a mass so it wouldn't make any sense to add those. So what you've got to understand here is that essentially what a set of scales is doing is feeling a force right fundamentally what it's measuring is a force. It interprets that force as a weight and converts the weight into a mass. And to convert a weight into a mass, you just divide by g. It may be doing that digitally or in some kind of analog way. We don't have to worry about the inner workings um, of the scales, but essentially it's just taking that force that it sees and dividing it by g to give you an effective mass. Now, if you take that force and divide it by g, you just get m g t squared divided by l, factor out the m over l, and you've just got gt squared left. So I'm just going to put gt squared there. And of course, you can combine the gt squareds to get m over l um, into 3 over 2 gt squared minus h. Now, this expression for m as a function of t that we've just derived is not the full story for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you can see that the bottom end of the chain is going to take a certain amount of time to actually hit the scales. So there'll be a period initially when the effective mass is just zero. And secondly, there'll come a time when the top end of the chain has just come into contact with the scales. Beyond that point, the entire chain is at rest and our effective mass um, expression won't apply anymore because the chain is no longer exerting an impulse on the uh, 
uh, the scales and it's just going to be constant beyond that point. So we want to think through some of those details and figure out what the various time ranges are for those different um, functional forms of m. So I've started by just sketching out a quadratic curve corresponding to that expression that we derived um, during the middle part of the motion. I've left a few gaps on the axes that we want to fill in. Um, firstly, let's think about this time here, the time when the mass suddenly jumps up from zero to some uh, non-zero value. Well, all that time is, is the time taken for the lower end of the chain to reach the scales. And we can use x equals a half gt squared, uh, rearrange it and use x equals h because the bottom end of the chain has an x coordinate of h. Uh, so you get t is just the square root of 2h over g. So I'm just going to mark that on there. This time should be root of 2h over g. And by exactly the same logic, this next time uh, is the time taken for the top end of the chain to reach the scales. The top end of the chain has an x-coordinate of h plus l. So all I've got to do is replace my h with h plus l. So this is going to be the square root of 2 times h plus l over g. So what about the corresponding masses on our m-axis? Let's start with the lower one. Um, well, all we have to do is note that at that point, t is root of 2h over g. That means half gt squared, which is x, half gt squared is just h, right? So if you go back to your m expression up there, this is now valid because we're on the quadratic part of the curve. Uh, if a half gt squared is h, then three halves of gt squared is just three times bigger, it's 3h. So you get m over l into 3h minus h, um, which means that m is just m over l times uh, 2h. And so I can put, let me write that on my axis, as 2h over l um, into capital M. What about the um, very maximum mass that we ever get, maximum mass reading that we ever get? Well, we just go through the same procedure, but for the bigger time. So now we know that uh, half gt squared is not h, it is h plus l. That means three halves of gt squared is 3h plus 3l. Substitute that back into our expression at the top. You get 3h minus h plus 3l which is 2h plus 3l, right? And so let me just make a note of that. Your m, a lowercase m, is big M over L into 2h plus 3l. I'm going to rewrite that on my axis in a way that looks a little bit more um, like that other mass expression that we got. I'm going to put the L into the brackets and write it like this, 2h over L plus 3. Uh, all into m. Finally, what's going to happen beyond this time here? Well, beyond that time, things are actually much simpler because you've just got the entire chain sitting stationary on the scales. And so provided the scales are working correctly, um, you are just going to get a reading of capital M, like the actual mass of the, uh, of the chain. So I'm going to draw just a horizontal line to represent the fact that our mass is constant. Let's make these bits solid as well. So that bit there, and then that little vertical jump there. And then just make a note that the y coordinate or the m coordinate there is just capital M itself. Now there are a few comments I want to make about the shape of this graph. Firstly, uh, about this point where we just enter the quadratic part of the graph. I just want to point out that's not a turning point and you can see that by just looking at your expression for m as a function of time. It doesn't have a linear time term and therefore the turning point of m as a function of t would actually be at t equals zero but this expression doesn't even apply at t equals zero. So there is no turning point um, on the bit of the graph where that expression is actually valid. And my other point relates to this 2h over l times m, which is that we'll think about what happens when you increase h. If 2h gets bigger than l, in other words, if the height from which you drop the chain is bigger than half the length of the chain, then 2h over l will be bigger than one. And this point here will move up and it will move past m on your y-axis. So that initial point might actually be somewhere up there and it just depends on the relative value of h and l. Now this makes physical sense because it's basically saying if you drop the chain from a large height then it's going to exert a very large force by the time the bottom of the chain reaches the scales because it's just had more time to build up speed and more speed means more impulse. And finally you might want to consider what happens as h goes to zero, what happens to the shape of the graph and to these values. Uh, firstly this point here will become the origin if you think about it because root of 2h over g and 2hm over l both become zero as h goes to zero. Um, that makes sense. It's just saying that if you start the bottom of the chain so that it's just barely in contact with the scales, then the effective mass will gradually uh, continuously increase from the very instant that you drop the chain. 
And I also want to point out that this maximum mass reading that you ever get uh, becomes just 3m in the limit as h goes to zero. So the biggest mass uh, reading will just be three times the mass of the chain itself. And that's the result of sort of a very classic physics problem that you might have seen elsewhere. It's reassuring that we can recover that using a limiting case of our uh, analysis. So that's all for now. Thank you for watching. And if you're interested, I am going to be posting a little mini series of increasingly difficult chain problems very soon. So I hope you'll join me for some of those.